Hello, everyone, and welcome to the record-breaking episode, episode number 50 of Power Spike with myself, Dom, and Monty to break down global League of Legends. And this is this is the prime time where we had playoffs all over happening. We had uh, finals happening here in the LCS. Uh, and yeah, hope that you guys are ready for a banger of an episode. Dom, uh, what are quick quick thoughts on this past week that was? Oh, it was, a, it was a long week for me, man. Like we have not only like all the LPL series going to game five, we've had three out of the first four going to game five, which is kind of how LPL normally goes. There's a lot of like Sosa's, lots of fucking bangers in there. Um, I mean, we had L we had LCK go to five games. We've had the full distance on LEC. So it has been absolutely a packed week um, of games, So, but it's been pretty fun overall. I mean, I've been liking uh, playoffs for the most part. No, just... It, it, I feel like it's content nonstop here, Monty. Yeah, I, I've uh, I haven't caught up on the latest LCK game that happened just a few hours ago because it was in the evening when I was dealing with my real life. But I will be watching those games tomorrow. I did catch the last few games of the LNG Weibo series, uh, which was fun for me until it was not fun because I wanted LNG to win. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it has been it has been good. We got a, we got an interesting result out of the LCS playoffs, an unexpected result, which is always fun. And then we got a very expected result of G two just continuing to smash people. Yeah, Ed, what are some of the biggest ones that jump out at you here, Dom? So far, unexpected results. Sure. Um, I, I think Weibo um, actually beating LNG because. Weibo looked rough for a long period of time and mainly for like the majority of the series the season Zhao who just didn't look like he was in form like he was good at all and then he came into playoffs and now he's just, just a fucking monster again out of nowhere like if you give him Tristana he just carries the game he's playing AD LeBlanc which no one else is playing people are playing a little bit of AP LeBlanc like Showmaker played some AP LeBlanc but no one is playing AD LeBlanc which I don't even know if it's good but he just feels like it feels like he just has confidence in it uh, reminds me of that Weibo team that ended up making it to Worlds last year. This is kind of how it looked in LPL, where the team was not supposed to do anything, and then Jahu just put everyone on his back and started carrying games. So, yeah, he's the Emperor of Spring for a reason. No one's surprised with uh, Damwon taking down KT and knocking out KT. And, uh, that was a breaks. coin flip. That was a coin flip. I mean, if you, you had to make me make a prediction, and it was KT, but that's like a 55-45. You know what I mean? Um, and for whatever reason, again, I haven't seen the 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 D plus versus uh, Gen G matches yet. But even though they always they've changed a bunch of their players, the majority of their players at this point in time. Um, if you guys remember last year, you know, D plus was intentionally or Gen G was not picking D plus because D plus was playing them very close. And Showmaker always seems to step up uh, versus Chovy. And you can change all those players, but they always just kind of go to the wire. Even the last best of three that we saw was a pretty impressive Showmaker Silas performance in game number one of the best of three. And um, yeah, it, 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 for, I don't know why, but those matches tend to be close for, for mystical reasons. I, I think the reason is because Gen G just plays like pretty safe early game overall. Like, and I think Dom One's best strength is their early game. I think Dom One, when they play, yep um like skirmishes and stuff they actually have a pretty good read on how to fight like when they can like take take skirmishes where i feel like genji is generally skirmish averse and they want to play the map wide and they want to like play for like consistent team fights later on so i just think it's a bad matchup for genji because um they just are are not used to the way damon takes skirmishes i mean it's kind of interesting because when genji plays against t1 t1's probably like another like probably the best skirmishing team in the lck but then for some reason like it feels like T1 just can't ever break through Genji, but it feels like Genji a lot of the times, like when I was watching the series, it felt like they just expected to win any type of team fight. They're like, oh, Damon will just int later on. Damon will just fuck up some macro and we'll just get to get some type of lead. Like they didn't feel like they had a, a killer instinct or so much of a game plan in, in, in a lot of those games. Like game four, it was just like, so we're just going to give them everything. We're going to give them every Drake. We're going to give them every fight, every inhibitor. Like, it was so crazy the amount that Genji actually gave up in that game without fighting. And then finally, when, like, two Nexus turrets are down, they're like, all right, it's time. Make our stand now. It's like, come on, bro. Like, we got to be trying to, like, skirmish something before that. But, um, yeah, watching the series, I, I was actually pretty disappointed with Dom 1's draft in game five because I felt like 
with how the series had, had been going, I thought there was a lot of options for Dom Juan to actually, you know, put put their foot on Genji's neck. Like, I wanted to see Varus Ash in that game. I didn't want to see them opt into, like, Zeri Yumi. Like, Zeri Yumi, like, Yumi's not even <laughs> good anymore. But it's just I like, mean, but they, they they did that shit. They did that shit against KT too, and that's yeah, exactly. just been that's aiming's like comfort zone, right? It's aiming because aiming's a very high resource AD carry, and it's like he gets thirty plus percent of the farm in the game, and so it's like just put the Yumi on me and I carry guys. Like that's I just feel that's like it played too much into man. what into what Genji wanted to do. Oh. I mean, I agree. I mean, you can look at the last you can look at the last series that they played against KT. And when you're talking about the early game stuff, they were like in game two, they were losing a bunch of early objectives. And then they like opt into Nocturne when Lucid yeah. was having very good games on on Lee Sin. Right. And uh, I think he had a, a good game on Jax after that. Um, but it was very weird that they wanted to do that because I agree, Dom, like at least in the in the KT series, it was very much about their early game and they have to get big enough leads that they can't fuck it up later because, you know, they're inevitably going to make mid and late game macro mistakes. Um, yeah. But they don't seem to know that about themselves, which is like, uh, this is a team that should never pick Nocturne. Well, ever. I mean, I, I just look at their games, right? And it's like, what games did they win when Showmaker was on LeBlanc, when Showmaker was on Ari? Like, those are the games where they're actually winning. What games are they losing? Like, they, they lose the games when they're forced to farm out. So if we are losing on, like, the, the other champions that are not LeBlanc and Ari, too, yeah. and we're playing, like, Vi, and we're playing these aggressive comps, and, like, the Lushinami is more aggressive, for example, than the Zeri Yumi, why in game five... Is Dom Juan opting into Sejuani, Yumi, Zeri? Like that feels just so low activity with a Zer as well. You know, it's like, where are you supposed to get the like advantage from? I mean, even Sejuani Aatrox is not a combo that's actually built to kill top lane. Like Sejuani Renekton is more aggressive. Champions that have auto resets are more aggressive. I know Aatrox technically has an auto reset, but you don't play Aatrox to like auto reset and and get a Sejuani stun. Like you have to actually use your E to um to to reposition your your Q1 or Q2. Uh, to actually engage on a gank. So it just felt like Dom Wan opted into um, Genji's game. That being said, Dom Wan still, I think, should have won that game. I thought Pays was, like, pretty bad for most of the series. Like, this is the guy who's heralded as the best AD carry in Korea for some reason. I don't know why he's better than Viper. Still I mean, I have out. literally, I have literally been so angry about that entire fact on every fucking show. So yeah. I can't figure it out either. It, yeah, it's nonsense. So, so we watch, like, Pays play and... Pays is just getting his ass beat by aiming for most of the series. That game five, like he had some really weird positioning errors, and also the build. I hated the build from uh, from from Pays in this game. Like he normally people are going Shiv um, early on every single champion because Shiv is just such a broken item. It's so overstated. But on Jinx, maybe you go like Shiv into Kraken. On some champions, you go Shiv into Kraken. But the 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 way that he built his items, Pays went Shiv, or sorry, he went Kraken into Shiv. And then he built an LDR. It was like, what the fuck is this, man? Like that game looked like a perfect Kraken IE LDR game. I don't, I don't see why he built a shift second in this game. It made no sense to me. So I, I didn't really like the, um, the item builds from, from Pays, And I thought there was a lot of positioning errors. And honestly, it felt like, felt like other players had to clutch up and carry him because it, he was a major liability in the series. Is there ever a reason why someone would build Kraken first into Shiv? Like, it makes sense you get Shiv because the stats in the wave clear when you're playing Jinx. But is there ever a world where you do that? I, I mean, yeah, I don't see why you'd go Kraken first. I mean, the whole idea is, like, Shiv is just so OP early, and it's, like, a yeah. really cheap item, so you can get your your spike faster. And, I, like, the, the real idea of going Shiv for a lot of these champions is, like... When you go Shiv early like that, you're just going a crit item. It's it's not as good of an item as Storm Razor, but it's cheaper, right? And then you just hit your like IE LDR spike quicker um, in the game. Or like if you don't need an LDR and you want to go Kraken second into uh, into IE, whatever. The whole point is that you are just hitting your three item spike, your two item spike, just way faster into the game because you know you're you're getting your Shiv so early. And if you look at the stats on Shiv, just like the AD attack speed, it's actually pretty good compared to Storm Razor. You lose the proc, but um, yeah, it's just considered to be solid right now. Obviously, there's exceptions where like uh, Lucian, for example, will go rapid fire second because of the interaction with Nami. But when I was watching this, I just don't understand why you'd ever go Kraken Shiv. It just makes no sense. Like the whole, like if you're skipping Shiv to go Kraken, then like I'm fine with that. If Kraken is really good on your champ, I'm fine with that. If you're like Zaya or something, but the whole idea of like Zaya is you're getting Navary like, second then or like on a champion like affiliates you're getting ie second then then third you get your ldr i don't understand why you'd go both of those items in that order yeah all right just just wondering that because uh i've i've 
play a ton of Jinx and I've seen the build come up. And the only time I've ever thought about doing that is when I'm on autopilot buying items and I'm like, oh shit, I already bought the, uh, in instead of buying, what is that? The car Critchis shard, yeah. uh, I already bought, um, recurve. Uh, yeah, Reaker Bow. So I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'll finish it. And now I'm like, this doesn't make sense anymore. So watching pros do it, just trying to pick the mind of you there. I mean, so. sh sh yeah, like I said, like Shiv into Kraken on Jinx is something that we see. I'm fine with that. I think that kind of makes sense. If you don't yeah. need LDR, like if you really need an LDR on three, I think you just go IE second. So you hit the, L the LDR IE spike earlier in the game. I mean, there's very fringe cases where you're fighting a lot and you need maximum combat power on every single item. But I think that's kind of rare. But it should always be Shiv into Kraken, not Kraken into Shiv. Cheers. Uh, again, big, big series there. And, and a damn one Kia that's looking dangerous as they move into playoffs. Of course, as this recording is happening, T1 will be playing later tonight. So uh, no T1 hate watching, or I guess T1 hate watching later. Not, not on, I mean, not on be, this episode. That's going to be the real banger. That's going to be the real banger, though, when Hanwa upsets T1. You right? think it's happening? I think it'll happen in the upper bracket, and then Hanwa will lose to them in the lower bracket. How are they going to lose them in the lower bracket when Damwon's going to beat T1? In the lower <laughs> oh, <laughs> the first okay. I mean, that would be... Uh, I, I Sign me up for this one. That would be very exciting. Um, are you becoming a T1 hater? Or like, what, why would you... Why, why are you down with the T1 losing? I, I'm a T1 fan hater. I don't hate T1. I hate T1's fans, and I like to see them sad. I'm nothing like pissing off half of our audience right off the jump. Guys. <laughs> also, to hey, be fair, you, you just made the other half of our audience very, very happy. <laughs> T, you know, the good T1 fans know why we don't like T1 fans. It's pretty uh, evident, right? It's pretty <laughs> evident. There are sane, some sane T1 fans out there. It um, is but funny. also, I, I just for the story of the LCS, I think it'd be very exciting to see a T1 losers bracket run. I do think we're just going to end up with with Gen G versus T1 in the finals again. Um, Bahanwa has been performing well when they don't let Zeka play Corky, which they keep doing. Uh, I was a bit concerned about Hanwa's performance in the early game in game one and game two versus Kwangdong because Cuz was kind of destroying them early. Uh, but game three restored my faith in Hanwa. They, they restored my faith in Hanwa. It was the, the kind of game that I expected to see in that series. Um, but their, their early game did look a tad shaky against the Freaks. But they, they managed to hold to 3-0. So we won't hold it too badly against them. I will hold Zekka's Corky play against him until the end of time, though. I mean, I, mean, I think it's... With it. I mean, he's won many games with it. That does I mean, not he mean, a game with it where of he, course, he looked kind of decent recently. <laughs> just not it's not his champ man he's got other things he can do with his time i think i think corky is actually just not that good of a champ period i'm gonna be honest like i i, I hate watching this champ i think I mean, he loses every game in lpl it loses a lot in the west like lck i feel like can make it work i just don't really like it i would dude if, if like even if corky can scale for free versus here i'd rather you just play talia every single time i think talia is so much of a better champ like obviously corky can poke and stuff but it just feels like anything goes wrong and the game just is lost. Like I hate comps generally where you're giving up so much early game and you're waiting for that like third Drake fight where you have package. And then like, if you lose that, the whole game's completely fucked. I just don't generally like that style of league. It's higher. It's higher risk, definitely higher risk. And we've seen even like uh APA come up with a stronger Talia recently. So, uh, well, it was also weird time. because Zeka has been in the last few weeks a significantly better Talia player, so it wasn't banned. It was a little bit weird that they didn't actually select it because he has been individually stronger on that champion as of late compared to the Corky. Dom, you, you, you segued pretty well for me because I brought up LCK surprise with with mm. Damn One beating KT. Monty brought up the LCS surprise, which I think is a pretty huge one with TL winning. You brought up Weibo, the one region. That we're not talking about with a surprise that did have a uh, corky incident, but more like an exekick incident <laughs> is LEC. Yeah. Uh, what happened? What happened to SK and exekick? <laughs> I mean, look, exekick just has major positioning issues. So, like he just is always dying way too easily in every single team fight. 
I mean, the the Corky package from Nisky was bad, but I, I I think that Nisky should never be on Corky. Like the type of player he is, even though they lost Talia <laughs> with Talia in game two, I would love to see him play anything with playmaking potential. If you think about Nisky historically, he's really good at playing the map. He's really good at like understanding when people can be killed. He's good at playing around his jungler. I don't see why you'd put him on a champion like Corky. Like he didn't even lane well on it. Um, and it just doesn't make much sense to me to put him in a situation that's like so uncomfortable especially when you think about how the team functions like sk their bot lane can kind of do decent in lane sometimes they're going to be a liability later on in the game i think the way that they should be playing is like give this game a matchup where he can f farm his lane and then just leave the lane and have him just roam to side lanes like have him just go up there with irrelevant and make some shit happen i think they should have higher proud aurelian soul talia all these types of champions because i think they're so much better for just the overall play style of the team yeah, uh, Monty, thoughts on I, LEC? I, I really, and, I, I really like Talia for Niski as well because the thing about Corky is it has the package, and we all know Niski has the tendency to uh, be a little bit reckless at some points in team fights. And if he if he's playing Talia, it actually he has to be out of combat for three seconds before he can use Talia wall, which then ensures it helps ensure that he cannot have any Niski int incidents where he just goes in because he can't just disengage and then immediately re-engage. He actually is forced to think for three seconds before he is able to tell a wall back in. Whereas if he just if he just packages, that's where the problems come in. Because he's yeah. going to turret dive with it and die and give up, you know, a thousand gold shutdown because that's what he does. So that's SK. They're out. How do you feel about the rest of the playoffs? Another Classico that goes G2's way, dumpstering, fanatic. Well, uh, in game one. I mean, was like what was... What was whatever it was what was so pathetic about that series from Fnatic is that they basically just gave up and like intentionally lost to rift herald at 20 minutes into the game I, I just didn't understand their thought process because they literally see the announcement that rift herald has been taken and then g2 walk into mid lane and remember g2 has volibear and they have a Zeri, and Zeri is standing under this turret thinking, I cannot possibly clear this wave. This Volibear with ult will kill me as this Herald charges down the lane. Humanoid is in top lane. You know, Razork is in the top jungle. They seem entirely unconcerned with this Herald that is in mid lane, and then they just straight lose the game. They just keep farming, and then they just lose. It was a very, very weird and sad end to that game. Uh, feels like uh, old, old man comms have come on back to Fnatic where it's like, no, you got it right. Cool. <laughs> That's it. No, yeah. no, no yeah. other thoughts. No other thinking. It kind of broke. Well, but Zeri can't clear the wave. You know what I mean? Zeri cannot defend that. You actually yeah. have to assign multiple people to deal with that situation. And Humanoid Razork were just completely unconcerned. Completely. Uh, what are other high level takeaways from the LEC playoffs, uh, Dom? Dude, we should how make is it a four team league. It should just be Mad Lions, Fnatic, BDS, and G2. And we should kick everyone else from the LEC. Stop wasting I mean, our we time. Can talk, we can talk about that Vitality BDS series because oh that my was God. shocking. It was yep. shocking BDS won that series. I, I actually. I was in complete disbelief. It was crazy that BDS could win a Vitality 3-0 in a best of three. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> BDS could win a Vitality 3-0. I mean, the thing is, Vitality is always that team, you know? Like, they, they might as well just be Dom one of, of the LEC. Like, where you, you know no lead is ever really safe with them. Like, they don't play macro well. I mean, they're just a solo queue team. That's how it feels. It feels like they're just solo queue players. It was It was a five, I think maybe 6,000 gold lead in game three at like, what, 15, 20 minutes, something like that, where it's like, oh my God, this is over. And then they got painted on. They got Bob Rost. It was, <laughs> it was a uh, Huey-tastic performance. Did, did they a get painted on? A Huey pentakill without ult, by the way. Yeah, that it, too. Did they get painted on or did Vitality cluster in Karzi walk up and use his ultimate so that he could just get burned by Huey and Renekton AoE into Oblivion? I mean, it, I mean, and Vito going into melee range to get a nice shove onto... I mean, Karzi going into melee range too, basically. Yeah, everyone just sat on each other. Uh, 
<laughs> it's it it was it was tough to watch. You watch it the first time around Red Buff, and you're like, okay, that was a little happy gaming. Now you know who to target, and then it happens the second time, and you're like, oh shit, it's over. And BDS can't even believe that they won. <laughs> I mean, it was so funny about the uh, the the first fight that went bad when Photon TP'd in on the Aatrox is they could have just secured vision and doubled back and gotten soul points. But no, you had to keep pressing forward. You just had to keep going with your huge ass lead. We couldn't just send somebody back to take Drake and then threaten Baron. We just had to keep going. We We must fight no matter what. Well, uh, LEC will continue to rush on in through their playoffs. G2 and BDS already confirmed to be the two teams playing in the in-person finals because no matter, or I guess in-person event, uh, the, at least was it championship weekend. There we go. It'll be a championship weekend as one and two. Fnatic Heretics, Vitality, and Mad, Mad Lions, Koi. How, how are we leaning here, Dom? What are we thinking in those two series? I mean, it's it's such a flip. It's literally just complete flip. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, bro. I, I feel like Mad got away with murder. Like, I feel like Mad should just lose because they, I mean, they didn't deserve to win against Giants. But then again, like, they have probably one of the most defined styles. Like, they actually have a way that they plan on winning games where I feel like it's like a roll of the dice for the other teams like Fnatic vitality like i have no idea what their their style is like how do they play league of legends if i were to say like what is what is the style of Fnatic to you what, what like do they play through bot top like are they like mid lane like what do they actually do when they get into a game of league of legends I mean, it's random every single game i i think you saw that just even in this series because like they don't even know like they play too many different styles of team compositions like they're pulling out the ash and the rumble in this series, and they clearly have no idea. First off, their bot lane doesn't know how to play Ash Rumble. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. And then, secondly, their team doesn't know how to play around Ash Rumble. Like, it was so fucking sad to watch nope. this because we have seen this lane now, especially from FBX, right? And to not know, like, when you can take some of these fights, it's like if you hit Rumble at level three and your heat management is good, you can actually just shit on them. I mean, like they straight didn't even, up they didn't even get an they hp lead in lane they, they didn't even yeah, get I know. an they hp were... lead in lane like you you look at how <laughs> this this lane normally looks i mean we saw this exact lane played by uh barrel and deft in lck yeah. and like barrel is like 1v2ing them behind the turret and like killing them like th this is such an op lane you're playing the strongest yes. lane and the way that it works is like maybe if nami lucian play it perfectly they don't have to die every single time but they can't be high hp and even in cs and have turret play like they they have to be losing out on some part of the game if you're playing ash rumble because you're so much stronger than them but they just like let them do whatever and then they're just losing 3v3 bot lane it's like if we're playing ash rumble zin Zhao, and we're losing 3v3 bot lane we ff like there's no point that we are playing if we're, yeah, if we're playing this aggressive and we can't kill them the poke is just free between volley and electro harpoon. It is extremely annoying to play into this lane and, you know, level two, then you get the scrap shield. So like rumbles, just like speed boosting himself and trading with you with E it's, it's just very, very irritating. Um, but yeah, I, I was, I was shocked and yet it may not even have been the worst rumble support that I saw this weekend. Cause I watched Busio play it. So <laughs> yeah, that's what I was say. Oh, it was worse than Busio's. I think. <laughs> I think it was literally worse I... than Busio's. Like, I mean, Busio at least had like a lead in lane. Like, there was literally nothing that Jun did right. He was like, wasn't Jun like zero nine at the end of the game, or like zero seven at the end of the game? Something seven, ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was oh seven. Um, well, I, I let's transition to that other series where the rumble was was not just the issue, but uh. Let's let's even just go back to both series, TL versus Cloud9, and uh, eventually TL versus FlyQuest. I think they surprised almost everyone. Dom, you put your picks in. You had FlyQuest winning, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I had FlyQuest yeah. winning. I think every uh, all three of us had FlyQuest winning. Yep. Um, just a surprise here that TL destroy cloud nine dismantle cloud nine and then they find a way against FlyQuest to get the victory i think 
huge step up performances by APA by Jan that continued through, you know, before maybe we blame it on their opponents or it was just a good weekend, but uh, they, they performed well there. Uh, was it umpty with the fifth, uh, the second pentakill in LCS history by a jungler, I think is, is the historical fact that was thrown out there on the Jackson game one that really set the tone. Um, what did you make of this team liquid weekend, Monty? You know, you know what's crazy is that everyone is very quick to play to praise Yun, but they don't actually mention that Core JJ stepped up massively within the playoffs. Which maybe I, I know it's crazy. Maybe Core JJ's performance improving also made Yun look better. Which you know isn't a diss to Yun because maybe he was just better the whole time, and Core JJ being terrible for like a year and a half, two years now was the reason why his skill wasn't shining. Uh, but Core JJ was, I think, very legitimately drawing rel bands by the by the time we reach into finals um, and looked significantly better than we've seen him in a while. Uh, impact, usual impact playoff form, doing exceptionally well. Uh, APA, I mean, he had... He was fine. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he deserved... <laughs> I don't think he deserved finals MVP. I don't think he deserved it. I think you could pick impact or umpty for that impact. one. Yeah. I think impact probably deserved it more than he did, but you know, he was, he was fine. I don't know. That felt very pained. <laughs> I mean, we'll see how fine he is at, uh, at MSI. That's all I'm going to yeah. say. Yeah. 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 Dom, what, what, are, what are your, I guess, overarching thoughts about, both series this weekend in the LCS. Um, just look like TL was just like the best team. They're the most cohesive team going forward. And um, yep. I think like Yon and Core JJ, like their their real test was against Cloud Nine. Like the fact that they were able to get through the Cloud Nine series matters more because when you play against like like no one is saying like oh Yon is Yon is like so bad he can't beat rookies the whole thing was like how do you, how is he gonna match up to like the top tier of of, of players and if you look at how LCS was the split. Um, the t teams that were surprising, FlyQuest and Hundred Thieves, both have these rookie bot lanes. I mean, no one is scared of Meech Ayla or Masu Busio. The whole idea of FlyQuest is supposed to be their top side supposed to run you over. Um, so, I thought Inspired had a pretty bad se series. It just felt like he was playing way too scared um, a lot of the time, and I really hated the approach of like Jensen just playing Annie over and over again. Like, I really thought that he should be playing some type of control mage matchup to you know, be able to actually outplay APA. I mean, he's supposed to be a better laner than APA. Give him some type of mage and let him do his thing. Didn't really happen at all um, in this series. And yeah, uh, the APA, like everyone always says that 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 APA can only play Ziggs and Asol, but it's like he just gets them every game. So like, I mean, if he's just playing Leo's them, pretty it's fine. Too. It's Leo was, was pretty good over the course of the playoffs. I mean, so when I mean, this guy made, he... was coming up in solo queue, he was an Asol to Leo two trick. Like he didn't mm -hmm. play Ziggs until I guess like recently or whatever, but like when he was coming up in solo queue, he was a Asol Talia two trick, and the way that he got rank one was by perma roaming. Like that was his advantage over people. Now the champions are slightly different, but those are always champions that he's been good at. So I think it's it's pretty like interesting. I think that TL just has by far the best coaching staff. If you look at like the approach from C9 mm -hmm. or their approach from FlyQuest, they have no clue well, like, what they're doing. Like they they, they like the know, drafts are fucking horrible. Like I don't know. The the story that uh, should probably be being told about FlyQuest is that their strategic mm. coach was put on leave immediately before finals weekend, like the Friday before. And that guy may have been actually important to their strategy, strategic coach after all, because uh, mm. they wouldn't have known their opponent was going to be Team Liquid until after the Team Liquid Cloud9 game. So the timing on that is absolutely shit. But of course, nobody is actually mentioning that fact, which is wild. Um, but it's actually just illegal in the League of Legends sphere to mention things that might give teams competitive advantages that are outside of the game, such as 2022 Worlds, COVID ravaging all of the Chinese teams with their garbage vaccines, uh, and then obviously being quite ill on stage. No, 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 no. LPL just sucks. <laughs> That's what we say. That's what we always say. Um, so, I, I mean, it feels like every time there is one of these external factors, 
that does, you know, show relevance to these conversations. It is just utterly ignored by the broadcast, by the main messaging. And it's like, how could you not tell the story even a little bit about, hey, they lost their strategic coach. It might have an effect on this matchup. In traditional sports, you would obviously tell that story. That would be the only story you'd be hearing. Yeah, you would need to do it once. Like, yeah, that's all you say. And, and not, not in large detail. Just like, hey, uh, as of yesterday, there were allegations of you know, uh, misconduct against the team, I guess. Trying Black to be Black a 13 year old German coach. boy and have sex with minors. <laughs> you wouldn't even bring Allegations. that up. That holiday. Holiday. That might, like to, to Monty's point, it's there is a way to do it on the official broadcast without putting everything out there. If you're worried as riot, like, you know, the scandalous nature of it, but you have to acknowledge the, the setback that was there. And Nuke Duck has, you know, He's been coaching for a year now, right? Because he coached over at 100 Thieves and then and now is over here at FlyQuest. So it's not like he's a veteran coach like Spawn, who's been working with the same players for three, four years now in the Team Liquid system um, with different head coaches and knows what he wants to do. Yes, it's first time head coach, but he's been around for a while. And Oh, yeah. He, yeah I think that's that's definitely very, very true. So... Uh, to to your point, Monty. Yes, I think it should have been brought up, and yes, I think it very much did affect the the uh, uh, outcome of that series. And also, you do kind of wonder, hmm, that is some very interesting timing that it came out literally the day they find out who they're playing. Especially, especially because guys, this didn't happen recently. This happened like four years ago. So the timing is mega suspicious. It's almost as if. And apparently, you know, according to the article that was written, was a well-known fact within the oceanic scene. So it's almost like somebody from Australia chose this timing specifically to fuck with him. I did not know this, by the way. Wait, you know who's also from Australia? <laughs> the coach of TL. Oh my God, Spawn oh, the coach of the perfect timing. Oh my God, Spawn. It was an inside it was job. Spawn. <laughs> no way, man. Well, inside of Australia, not inside of FlyQuest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Papa um, Smithy's also from Australia. It could have been an inside job by Papa Smithy, I guess. Technically. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. The, the Australians owning their own. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it it is. The timing is mega suspicious because it happened like literally the day before playoff weekend. Um, and I, I can't think that this was coincidental if this stuff happened before he was on, well before he was on FlyQuest four years ago. And now is the time that these allegations surface and he has to be put on leave while the investigation moves forward. That can't be an accident. Yeah. Uh Tough for FlyQuest. Still needed to show up on the day. You do wonder about the the Ergot pick, maybe in game number one. For really? I, I, th sure. I, I'd be wonder wondering about that if I wasn't spending all of my brain power wondering how they can't play into Smolder Tom Kench. And I literally went back, Degon, to watch the Fnatic G2 game, which also had Kaisa Nautilus from Fnatic into Smolder Tom Kench from G2. Because I was curious how you could, like, first off, I don't, I don't even think the Kaisa was a good pick here. Like, why is nobody able to pick Ash in the fucking West and just, like, smash a lane with it? But it's like, Tom Kench Smolder is about the most passive piece of shit lane you could ever pick. And, like, that needs to be punished. Now, what Fnatic did was they didn't necessarily punish it, but what they did was they just pushed out and then they recalled, got a cull and tear on Kaisa and then played for the Muramana Ludens build on Kaisa, okay? Now, what we saw 100 Thieves do was not push, like intentionally not push the lane, have the lane push into them, build Kraken Slayer on Kaisa, and have Busio wander in the river in a three versus four, get himself killed to smolder to accelerate the smolder. So they never had any pressure, and they didn't do anything else on the map, and they did a stupid build. Like, how, like, and you were running Lethal Tempo Kaisa 
How are you going to get a bunch of auto attacks on Kaisa against the Smolder after 22 minutes? You're not. It's fucking terrible. It's terrible. Like, and this is why Team Liquid tilts me a little bit because I can't fault the coaching staff because it fucking works in, a, in NA. But like the things that they do make me angry because nobody actually punishes the choices that they make in the games. Not consistently enough, at least. And it feels like... I And you can go back to the NRG squad from last year. It felt like you had one positional coach per player to bounce these things off of and really question, like, hey, how do you punish this? Why should they do this? And, uh, you know, a lot of these teams don't have that But D-Gun... And, and look, I know that their strategic coach was gone, but it's like nuke duck, buddy. You know they're going to play smolder. Like, you you really don't have a plan for, like, weak smolder lane? Like, this is it? I've already seen this game. It happened in Europe. Yeah. Well, both teams get to go to MSI, <laughs> and we'll get to learn. This time, FlyQuest will have the plane gains as the warm-up to see if they're able to bounce on in. We'll come back to uh, the LCS playoffs in season in just a little bit. But before we do, um, that was a quick taste of the LOL Esports playoffs sphere that have happened so far. And so we just wanted to take a second to remind you of one of our new friends joining the team of Last Free Nation. It's our friends over at Factor that help us keep nourished in our busy, busy lives. Dom literally went from uh, streaming five game series, has done that now multiple times, into a talk show. And uh, quick two minute meals always available for you through Factor, our friend here on the podcast. Every fresh, never frozen meal is chef crafted, dietitian approved, and as I said, ready in two minutes. Uh, you can get popular options like Calorie Smart Keto, Protein Plus, or Vegan and Veggie. That plus additional add ons. And actually, I have one of the add ons with me right here. Ooh. It's the shots. So you can have health shots here. And so I have this one, the lemon, apple, ginger, honey, turmeric, black pepper shot for health. And so I'm going to go ahead and use that one. Uh, Monty, again, have you gotten yours yet? Your factor? No, your factor I, I no, I'm in Korea. I'm going to get it in May, though. I'm almost there, less than a month. And I will have my own to discuss on the show. <laughs> yeah. Dom, again. I know I normally ask you this one, but what is your favorite one? What's your favorite meal? Favorite one? So the best one that I've had is the um, chicken thighs. It's like the chicken thighs with mushroom, which is not something that I would normally like, but it's actually, I think, just like their just best tasting meal. Um, it's it's just chick it's just chicken thighs in like a cream sauce is essentially what it is with like some mushroom in it. And that one is is actually just delicious. It has some like wild rice in there as well. So it's a, it's a it's like a really nice one. It's pretty filling. Um, I think it's like 540 calories or something. Pretty filling um, and just tastes amazing. So, yeah. Again, once you get on the subscription, you can customize your schedule, your delivery schedule. So you can get it. You figure out if you need it, how many you need weekly. So as much and as little as you need. And you can pause and reschedule deliveries to suit your lifestyle. This is your solution for fast premium meals without the need for cooking. And here we go. Bottoms up. Yum. All right. So, friends, healthy? I feel, feel healthier? very oh. healthy right now after my turmeric spice shot. Mm. Yeah, so now head on over to guys. Meals. What? Go. What was that? Oh, I was just going to say, those have a kick to them. I've had them before. I They're like kind of spicy. I'm trying to hold it in right now. <laughs> yeah. I did good. I did good. Yeah. Head on over to factormeals.com slash powerspike50 to use code powerspike50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. That helps us out uh, over here at Last Free Nation. That's code powerspike50 at factormeals.com slash powerspike50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is live here in the U.S. Thank you so much to our friends over at Factor.
Oh man, it does have a kick. I'm trying to keep it in. <laughs> yeah, they're spicy. They're spicy. <laughs> they are spicy, and now I'm very awake for uh, a fan favorite segment. Clears the sinuses. The show. It does. It's so nice. I've been waking up lately with one nostril like clogged, and it sucks. And now I can breathe out of both. See, it's very, very, very good. Um, Same actually. All right, let's uh, hop on into this week's fraud alert and it's a fan favorite they are a team that always gets the benefit of the doubt until they proved otherwise and this weekend they proved otherwise we're talking about cloud nine this week's fraud alert how fraudulent are they let's find out all right monty cloud nine they were supposed to be the super team. When we, when we look at signings in the offseason, people forgot about, I don't know, Jensen going mid to FlyQuest because JoJo going over there was supposed to be the thing. It's a homecoming for Vulcan, the former multi-million dollar man. Uh, Jack said, love me some fudge and gave the vote of confidence. This team was supposed <laughs> to run it back and instead they find themselves missing out on international play. Um, I mean, it's it's frankly embarrassing. Is it at the scale of the Team Liquid $7 million roster or uh, super disaster, Chernobyl-level disaster fraud, 12 out of 10 uh, fraud team? No, but I mean, this team should be making MSI. They were the favorites in the Team Liquid match, pound for pound, their skill should be there, but they have no idea how to actually play together. They have no idea how to execute their team compositions. We brought this up last week about their comps against FlyQuest, where they couldn't figure out how to engage with a Sejuani or a Rumble ult. They couldn't figure out how to front to back team fight. And this is just, I mean, it's just fucking embarrassing at this point in time. Um, it, it is confusing how they keep losing these games. Um, if you want to see how they don't know how to play these comps, like Fudge is on Olaf, which is designed to ghost ult in the late game to track down Varus and Ziggs in the back line, and they never are actually together for an entire fight in game three. Basically, Fudge is just zoned off every single fight by Impact, which credit to Impact, by the way, but it shouldn't be the case that they can just pick you apart every single time. Why are you never capable of grouping in advance of an objective and taking vision control and actually using a team composition properly. They can't use any team comp properly. Dude, and that's so embarrassing. They can't, they can't <laughs> get to a point where they that's can fair. win because like they, they have Fudge just being behind Perma every single game. Fudge is just getting railed by everyone. That is literally what it's become. Like, I think Fudge is just so fraudulent at this point. Like it, the way that he plays the game, it's like, what can he play? He plays like just Renekton. He's like Renekton one trick. You saw the Olaf pick into Renekton looked absolutely fucking terrible. He was just getting fucked by impact the entire time. I mean, it's so hard to play league when you're top laner. Like top lane is supposed to be one of the strongest champions in the game at all times. Like you are generally the highest level and competitive. You're able to get items like you're supposed to be able to make so much space, but they have no top laner. So how do they ever get into like positive situations? I just think that that they need to figure out a way to get fudge on picks that are going to be useful no matter what, or they just need to move on from him. What is so crazy to me is that Jack has typically been very ruthless about getting rid of players or benching players. And yet Fudge has remained on this roster for years and years and years. Does Fudge know some very dark secret about Jack? Like, no. wh why? <laughs> why is it? Why is it? that he has been able to maintain this position. Now, I know they were talking to Wonder during the offseason, so there was a question as to whether Fudge would be on this roster. Um, mm -hmm. But they have an import slot available. But as I've said previously in our discussion of the Fudge versus Vulcan last week, I'm not even sure that changing out Fudge fixes this team because they still have very severe shot-calling issues and macro issues. Um, and top laners are not normally the people who will be making those decisions in the mid and late game or are not the most vocal ones on the team. 
Yeah, I, so, mean, I think, I think what happened is, is very simple, right? Like they had Summit, which was like the player who was supposed to be one of the best top laners in the world when he came to Cloud9. And they had to deal with all the problems of like having a carry top laner and like having the whole team play around him. And what they decided was they moved Fudge back top. They just want somebody stable top lane. But like stable to them is like just not hard losing all the time, like losing kind of all the time, which is just not who Fudge was originally. Fudge is just getting worse and worse. Um, and I think it's because he's getting healthy. I think if he was back to his, <laughs> his, his old ways, he would have just uh, still been the goat. But it is what it is, man. I heard you talking about so, it earlier. It's it was the it, the yeah. what was it moobs? Who who was it? Who had the moobs? It was Gilius. Uh, Gilius had bitch tits. Bitch tits. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Gilius explained to us uh, his his story about having bitch tits um, before, but that was actually one where he was saying that it made him worse. But I mean, when I'm watching pro league, it's like I just I don't know what it is, but it's like I feel like these these players just like I don't know if they just don't care that as much as before because it felt like Fudge was always like the player that was really on top of every single lane. Like he understood how everything functions and he was so smart about the game. And now it just looks like he's just doing whatever. Like he just wants to get carried to another championship. This is interesting. I I just you know Fudge. I'm pretty sure with this Cloud9 roster has never finished worse than third. This Cloud9 roster has never finished worse than third with Fudge. What, what do you mean this Cloud9 roster? Uh, or sorry, with the Fudge, Fudge on the Cloud team, Nine. they've never finished worse than third. Uh, they got fourth with uh, Summit, right? Uh, mid Fudge, yeah. Sorry, with Mid Fudge, they got third, fourth. In, I mean, that was uh, also a choice that playoffs. they made was to roll swap him. It was just um, straight up fourth, no. Yeah, but that was that was sorry, it was fourth spring playoffs, third, fourth in lock in. Uh and that was with mid fudge. But with Fudge as a top laner, they've never finished worse than third. And it, it just it it is it speaks to the caliber of expectation from Cloud9, but also how good this team could be. And also you just start to wonder like what else was was missing, you know, mid game. Shot calling is what they would say uh, in, in post-game interviews. You wonder how much of that came from like Sven. You wonder why like no one else is stepping up and making those calls. Uh, and it just feels like because top lane is so isolated and you can see the struggle from Fudge, he takes a brunt of the blame. But then, you know, w w where else can it be put? Where else could could you start calling out things on, you know, maybe the two-time on Blabber? Like, wh where's the aggressive uh, play that we're used to seeing Jojo played well most of the time, but he, he got outplayed by APA um, in this series. So where does the rest of where, where, where are other problems that we can find on this cloud nine roster? I mean, I think the, the problem I mean, I is it's like, because they don't have multiple places that are playing aggressively, it just feels like they're trying to scale. They're trying to do the Gen G in North America where they're trying to like scale into fights, but they don't have superior macro to other teams. So, I think the biggest I think the biggest issues are number one fudge. Number two, I think their coaching staff is dog shit. Like I don't know if it's just Mithy there or who else is helping him. Like I know Mithy Vayner and V2, Vengar like, V2 is remote. But he's like not on stage, so he can't actually do anything to affect right. like he can which uh, which is just not super effective, like when it comes to actually drafting. Like there's always gonna be pivots. Like you can have an idea, but when it comes to like actual draft, you need to be there because things are always going to happen the day of based off like how they're playing, like yeah. in between, like you have to call in be like, Oh, what do you think Vagar? I mean, I think that they just need a better coaching staff. I feel like the myth like, plan for games are just so bad. Maybe, maybe Jack can petition to have um, the lifeline from who wants to be a millionaire added during draft so they can call <laughs> Vagar V2. Yeah. I, I keep know. thinking about this. I feel like Jack has done whatever not what everyone, but whenever there were times to make rules, he would always try to accept rules or try to get things in there that would benefit him a lot and sell it as like good for the league. And I, I don't think anything's wrong for that. So if he did put in like, what if, you know, what, what if we could get, you know, uh, uh, phone a friend or, or you know, let's, let's spice up the league. The league needs something. And then he sells them like, I can think of that. <laughs> uh, look, as long as we get a listen in. So here's, here's the, here's the trade. Here's the trade. The teams get the lifeline, but we get to hear the lifeline on broadcast. Ooh, that'd be okay. fun. 
So yeah. you have to give up your you have to give up your strategies to the public and to the other teams, but you do get to actually have help. <laughs> Worth I'd like that. Which 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 comms would you love to hear, Dom? Um, out of all the comms, I would just love to hear like the comms of uh, honestly. If it was only C9, I would love to hear the comms of like the the Yone like rumble game, just like them being like, okay, don't fight ever, like don't fight like no matter what. Just I would love to hear how they they got a comp like this and they decided never to make anything happen because you know that it's got to be like somebody trying to instigate some level of aggression and then everyone just shutting it down. No, no, we shouldn't fight for this. We shouldn't fight for that. Like I would love to hear that. Um, I would love to hear like fudges like how they decide on fudges champion every single game it's like uh so do you want like renekton or do you want renekton for this game and it's like game three it's like all right bro this is probably the last game you're ever playing with cloud nine so i guess you can play olaf like whatever man go out with a fucking bang so i mean i would i would love to to just hear either draft around fudges champion or just that one game the yone rumble game from uh game two versus fly quest i think yeah game two versus fly quest that was there was there was a lot of dying, not a lot of anything else happening. Um, all right, Monty, fraudulency. Where do we rank on this now that the season is over? Look, they did finish third, which is, I mean, basically, I think the bar was: do they finish top two so they could go to MSI? Most people, myself included, thought that they would be in first place. You know, it, but FlyQuest was supposed to be good before the start of the season too. So I think some people could have reasonably put FlyQuest as their team that they expected in first. Nobody put Team Liquid in first, okay? So they were a massive dark horse. Obviously, they powered up throughout the playoffs. Credit to them. Um, but I think it's like a 7 out of 10 for Cloud9. I, yep. It's just there's no synergy. Um, and you, I think you can see the importance of the coaching staff. If anything, guys, the takeaway from these this finals weekend at LCS should be Coaches are giga important because we got to see Team Liquid, who has a great coaching staff, and the coaching staff is probably the number one reason they actually won this title. Yeah, We got to see what happened when FlyQuest loses a coach right before finals, and then we got to see what a team looks like that has barely any coaching staff the entire time, and what it ended up as is a team with virtually no growth and a very weak understanding of teamwork, macro, and win conditions. Dom? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's pretty much a 10 out of 10 fraudulency for me. Like, it's as fraudulent as, as you can come. Like, I just don't think it's real. Like, you have people that are all supposed to be the best in their position or, like, some of the best in their position. I mean, you took Berserker, who was the best player in the league, with Jojo, who was maybe the second best player in the league. You put him on a team with the best jungler of all time in North America on the same fucking team with Vulcan, somebody who's won multiple champions, won championships, one of the best supports in the region's history on the same team. And overall, there was not any other really big super teams in North America. You look at the level of the other teams and it's like APA and Yeon ended up winning the title. FlyQuest is not supposed to be a project that's supposed to win in the first split. Like they look like they would be good, but they're bringing up Masu. They're bringing up Busio. 100 Thieves has Meech and Ava. Like that team is not to, like, and Sniper is coming in in his first split. Like the competition was so weak this split in the lcs like i think the players overperformed on a lot of the different teams but if you're talking about like did we have a bunch of super teams expected and really strong teams yeah yeah like within the lcs no the expected competition was just was not good enough for you to get third in the split like you need to at least get top two and it's it's not even just that they got third it's like they got hard ass beat into third it was like 3030 get the fuck out of playoffs bitch like it was it was tough it was tough especially after watching them dismantle 100 Thieves earlier, and then we just found out 100 Thieves was just not that good and hit a rough patch as well. Um, all right, you know what to do, chat. Let us know how fraudulent this Cloud9 roster is and why in the comments below on this video. Um, and uh, we'll read out a couple and see how strongly you feel on this Cloud9 team, whether you're a Cloud9 fan. And please let us know if you're a Cloud9 fan or or not you don't even have to be a hater or you can let us know if you're a hater or if you're just in the middle uh how fraudulent is this team let us know in the comments below and while you're there like and subscribe thanks all right next up 
Time for a keeper kick, and we're going to Europe. Uh, these two teams, we touched on them earlier when we took a look at the LEC playoffs. Uh, are we keeping or are we kicking BDS or Fnatic? Let's get into it. Uh, both teams still alive. BDS find themselves well, a little further along. It depends but... on your definition of alive. They're alive. <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean, Monty? I mean, they might be in the iron lung equivalent of LEC playoffs. <laughs> you know, they're 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 comatose on life. There might be potatoes on life support. I mean, technically alive, maybe. I mean, those are probably the two teams that are like favorites to go to MSI. <laughs> MSI, yeah. <laughs> Not great. Not a great sign. I mean. Uh, again, BDS kind of, we, we talked about it. They really shouldn't have won that series. Uh, and then Fnatic just get pummeled and lost to Rift Herald. Which one feels like is, <laughs> can replicate better performances compared to what we saw in their, uh, in their round two matches? So what I, I'll start with, I'll start with what I like about BDS. So okay. the problem here is that, so on an individual basis, I think it's quite clear that Fnatic should be better. But we have now had years of the Razor Cuminoid experiment, and it just has <laughs> never actually lived up to its potential, even though Razork has been really fucking good this year. Um, and Humanoid has actually looked quite good at times, not in this series, but he's actually looked much better than his normal, like, LEC regular season self at times. Um, but, you know, they decided to bring in June in the bot lane. I haven't seen anything that makes me believe that the Noah and June pairing is some sort of massive upgrade, especially given the context of, like, the Ash Rumble stuff we were talking about earlier. They don't, like, you go from Ash Rumble one game, and then you pivot into Zeri fucking Nautilus the next game. It just feels like Horrible whiplash. Like... I, don't, I don't even like Zeri Nautilus ever, to be honest. <laughs> like, it just doesn't make sense, so. Um, also, I mean... Noah just, you know, spectacularly surfing into the back line to get minigunned into oblivion by a lethal tempo jinx while he misses all his cues was certainly, you know, something to watch in that game. Yeah, I mean, it, it was at least he played aggressive for once. Like, that was the silver lining. I'm like, damn, Noah is like generally overly pussified in, in, in fights. Like, it feels like this guy is just allergic to dealing damage no matter how strong he is. I mean, there's some games where he is giga strong and he's just not able to, like, carry. It feels like he's just trying to not die um so at least he played aggressive that was a silver lining but i mean overall like if it's if it's a straight up like keeper kick i guess i'll keep bds and and kick Fnatic just because i feel like bds is actually still like even though they don't look as good as they did pre-adam benching in winter they are still better than they they should be when you look at like the o o average mm. level of their players. It feels like they still have like some synergy amongst the pieces, whereas Fnatic is just depressing to watch. They're like Cloud9, right? Where it's just you feel like these players should be so much better than they actually are. Like watching the way Humanoid throws his leads, like, dude, this guy was like the best Oriana player in Europe before. Like during 2021, when this guy won two championships, he it was like, give this guy Oriana. He's 20 CS on everyone, including Caps. He's just beating everyone's ass. This guy was so fucking good. And now you watch his lead and it's like, gets a solo kill on Caps. Like, all right, let's see how he takes over this game. By 10 minutes into the game, Caps has just got three kills and he's just running away with it. So I would keep uh, BDS because I feel like they have like more ability to grow as a team. Um, or maybe not even more ability to grow. I just think that they, they will be better as a team than Fnatic is. Fnatic is a team that has better players that have like anti-synergy. I'm pretty sure they always will. What I find very interesting, and I, I agree, Dom, I, I kick Fnatic. I'm just so sick of Fnatic at this point. I'm sick of this roster. I'm sick of Razork and Humanoid playing together. Like, I need to see some of these players on different teams with rosters that could actually challenge G2 because we just know it's never going to happen for Fnatic at this point. Like, how many more years of, like, getting whipped is it going to be? before we get to jailbreak these players and get them onto rosters with synergy I mean, that could worse. actually... Yeah, it's true. 
Um, that is, you know, and and also what I like about BDS is I think they are also in a position where their coaches have been very good going back to the coaching thing and them being more than the sum of their parts. And they always, you know, they have a particular way that they play the game at any given kind of period of time or any given split. And what I find very interesting is that last split, it was all about Barris, Ash, and Jin for ice. And what they were doing was they were playing a lot of like either lane bullies or, you know, effectively champions with long range engage, like 80 carries with long range engage, whether it was the Barris ultimate or the Ash ultimate or Jin W. And they were playing around kind of like, hard engage from the ADC position. Um, and they've completely changed that now where it's like Zeri's like the only fucking champion they play anymore. Like they played, they played five games of Zeri in playoff, three of Aphilios, um, that were right in the regular season. And then in the playoffs, they played four games of Zeri and one game of Zaya. Um, and, you know, you might notice that this is a trend of an older BDS roster because this looks like what Crowdshot would have done uh, on this team. And so they have really, I think, fundamentally shifted their identity. But once BDS and the coaching staff and the team like decide on something or like run a strategy, they usually have enough depth to their champion pools, but they can effectively run out very similar types of, of team compositions. Um, and they find like a few champions to play around and they activate their players you know, all their, their players kind of are doing the same, like going through the same, um, you know, win conditions every game for the most part when it comes to their own team composition, but with slightly different iterations. And I think that makes them more coherent because they're not unlike what we saw from Fnatic, where it's like one game we're trying to like bully with Rumble Ash and failing. And then the next game we're switching over into Zeri Nautilus and like, trying to scale um it it feels a lot better what bds does because it gives their players more consistent frameworks to work from and i think that's one of the big strengths of bds is that they have enough flexibility to not be banned out but they still are kind of more or less doing the same thing every single game and we saw that in winter as well and that's what really fueled their success i think good coaching and it's good planning uh what i liked about this series was that I feel like Adam didn't have the greatest series and the team was still able to pick him up. We know that Adam can be a focal point. I mean, he was, <laughs> yeah, he was, he was bad. actively bad, <laughs> in, yep. yeah. especially he, in, in lane. I mean, I think some of his Gragas plays in the team fights were fine yes. later on, but like yes, yes, yes. the lane phase was rough. I mean, he literally doesn't know what items to, like he went row a second. I went on a rant about this. There's actually, it's just the most brain dead thing ever. But I mean, I, was, I guess whatever, I was, like. I was reviewing this and I was like, he's got one stack at 19 minutes. Like what? Yeah, I mean, the funniest thing is that he like has, he has like Roa and, and obviously like there's, there's just a sub, um like a subsect of, of people that watch pro games that are always trying to justify what a pro player does, no matter if it's like completely wrong. Like they're like, they have this idea of pro players like pro players are like some fucking super geniuses and they always do everything for a reason where it's like, no, Adams is probably something of an idiot and he doesn't play too much Gragas. Like, that's probably what it is. But we're just going to pretend like it, it it it's just some like mastermind plan. And people were like, dude, the reason why he goes row a second is because he wants to have that later game level spike, which, number one, doesn't even make much <laughs> sense. Right. Like. <laughs> Because like you have like the the like once you get the ten stacks you get that that level up and it's like oh no, like, yeah, he wants to level. try to go from like fifteen to sixteen and get a bigger power spike later in the genius. game where it's like genius where it's like you you like you you would rather have more AP health and mana for a longer portion of the game than to just be like stacking it throughout the whole game and like be like up oh, this one insignificant fifteen to sixteen level spike on Gragas it's is right. gonna like carry the game those, those are the Dom those are the same people that think that playing more games from the loser's bracket is an advantage because mm -hmm. you get to warm up, you know, you, you're not coming in cold. It's the same yeah. concept, right? They believe that you should literally intentionally lose a series to go into the loser's bracket because that's an advantage. Yeah, yeah, so they're T1 fans, right? Because that was the whole complaint, <laughs> right? That was the whole complaint is that the reason why T1 ended up losing in spring is because they didn't get to lose where Genji got to lose. It was such a oh huge advantage. Oh my God. It was a mega advantage. In fact, I fully expected T1 today to lose intentionally to Hanwha so they you, could you get that funny, sweet, though? Like, sweet loser's bracket advantage. You look at the discourse, right? And when when that happened to T1 in in 
winter where they came in from the winner's bracket and then or spring technically but when they came in from the loser's bracket and then gen g just beat their ass everyone like there was there was a reddit post on it there was so much like talk in the community about like how much of a disadvantage this was and people were talking about like oh should it be like a best of seven with one game advantage going to like the team that actually is coming in from the w- the no. winner's bracket like what should we end up doing and then in summer the same exact thing happened right but genji ended up just winning the series where it, where it was like T1 was coming from the loser's bracket, right? T1 lost. They were coming from the loser's bracket and Gen G was in the winner's bracket. But then when Gen G won, there was no one talking about like how much of an adva- like how great it was that Gen G won with such a big disadvantage over T1. Like we just didn't have that conversation at all, bro. Like this is the, the problem that I have with the community is it's so inconsistent. And then, you know, you're just supposed to accept it. But anyways, to finish the uh, the BDS point, the funniest part about that that situation with the Roa, with the justification, is people are like, he's going for the later game level spike. And it's like, he the game ends, he still had not hit the 10 steps. So he never got the level during the game. And then as after the Nexus explodes, like, you know how, like, after the Nexus explodes, sometimes, like, Harold will still charge, or you'll be able to, like, cast it a bit, like, queue up uh-huh. an ability, you can cast it as the, the Nexus is exploding. So Nexus explodes, and then as you see like the victory screen and it starts zooming out, you see the level up just hit. And it's just like, you see like the animation from Rowan. It's just like, he's leveled up now. Like that was the best part of that entire situation. That's funny. Yeah. I, I, while you guys were going off on that tangent, I went back to look at the LCS. There's been a lower bracket run by every team since 2020. Uh yeah interesting yes the, the the lower bracket team eventually won and let me look back in 2019 as well 2019 no so 2019 was the last time where teams from the upper bracket side ended up winning it. oh no, no no sorry yeah it did happen in 2019 so it's happened every year at least one of the splits oh it's happened one of those because last year cloud nine was in the winner's bracket yeah. and won right but if you go to last year, it was so Cloud9 won spring, but then in summer, it was NRG from the lower bracket. Yeah. So it happens so NRG once from the lower bracket last year. The year before that was, uh, let's see, 2022. It was EG. EG. The year before that was 100 Thieves, 100 Thieves from the yeah. lower bracket uh, against TL. The year before that was uh, TSM beating FlyQuest. Remember FlyQuest that made both finals they lost to tsm and then mm-hmm. the year before that it was uh tl, TL win- winning both bracket. from the winners 19 yep. yes and that was in spring so you know it, it is an argument <laughs> but not that it's had any bearing on it uh either way uh so we kick in this fanatic roster since it's been pretty cooked I'm just done with it, man. Like, I'm so sick of it. Like, they're never going to win. I'm, I'm tired of what... I would rather just be excited about a new roster of Fnatic players that I, I can delude myself into thinking might actually be able to take a win off of G2 rather than just continue to watch this. I can't do it anymore, man. I can't do yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, the fans can't do it either. I was looking at the Fnatic subreddit and they are all over the lineup I oh mean, yeah the, the thing is it's not even like it's not even like fanatic is is kind of staying at the same level it's like no they're getting their ass beat like harder and harder now like now they're just getting like 20 minute 21 minute game where it just doesn't even feel fucking close you watch this series it literally felt like g2 could never lose to fanatic well i just don't understand why we got rid of trimby for june that's what i don't understand I don't Korean understand either. <laughs> Jun was <laughs> Korean challenger, though. Oh, great. <laughs> All right. You know what to do, y'all. Let us know in the comments below who you keep and who you kick in and who you're supporting beforehand. If you're a Fnatic fan that's already salty and you would kick your own team, props to you if you own up to it. Let us know in the comments. All right. To close it on out. We look at the year that was the LCS. So not just playoffs. We've kind of like knocked that one down pretty well. But um, just this year, big, big changes that came across the league. Eight teams, Commissioner Mark Z, uh, some fines that came across. Uh, let's, let's, Let's dive into it in this week's Galaxy Brain Club.
when we think about the year, Monty, how do you think people are the split? How do you think people remember spring 2024? I think there was a lot of good things that happened. Um, I think that the broadcast was generally more fun. I think the games were more fun. I appreciated that uh, shitty EG got the boot from the league. Um, it was great to continue in LCS without annoying TSM fans. So that was another big positive. Um, it, you know, in general, I think the games were, if they weren't high quality, at least they were entertaining. I liked the fact that we got to see more player personalities via the pros segments. And like, you know, as much as I hate their stupid ass Twitch messages and tweets that cover the item box that I need to see to do analysis of the game. <laughs> I did appreciate the all chat that they threw in there during playoffs. Cause like that was fun. And I felt actually told the story of, you know, the game and what was going on better rather than somebody just going, let's go to yell in Twitch chat, which is just vapid. Right. And, and completely useless. Um, so I think a lot of the changes that were made, I think the pre-recorded drafts helped speed up the games, which I appreciated. Um, I think, you know, for the most part, the creative changes that were made to the league overall were good. Um, and the game quality itself was fun. There's no butt. Wow, y'all, that's oh no, there's a butt. Monty, there's Monty gave a Monty gave the praise without the 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 hammer that came right after. Wow, I'll do the awesome. butt for there's, Monty. There's... The butt is that less people are actually watching the product. So that yes. that yeah. because Bayano is co-streaming and they're 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 number one. The peak was down even with Cadrill and Bayano both co-streaming with like seventy thousand combined viewers or something like that. The peak was still down. And this is not me saying this is Monty's butt, by the way. I'm not negative. Yeah, about I, I, I'm actually, I, he's just, uh, I'm typing to him right now. He's just reading what I'm typing. Yeah. So yeah. Revive's hype down, and okay. The, and the viewer, the average viewership increase is not as much as the actual, like, it's just all artificial. There you go. <laughs> and not only that, but it wasn't that much of an average viewership increase. And, Degon, people want to compare it to last spring. But we also have to remember that last spring was on weekdays. And the reason we switched back to weekends was to have better viewership, even though they told us last spring that it would have better viewership on weekdays. They told us that the, the data said that viewership would be better on weekdays. And remember, we didn't get the LEC hosts or the raids into LCS on those weekdays because LEC wasn't happening at that time. Right. So guys, the real comparison is to compare it to spring of 2022 when these factors were similar and then count in the fact that Cadrill and Bayano are now allowed to co-stream and count in the fact that street co-streamers can now co-stream all of the games instead of just super weeks and playoffs. And if you look at that data, guys, the tears will flow because it's fucking bad. Um, and also there's the other problem. I'm gonna make a video about this but because the lies from Riot are going to flow forth very soon about how viewership has increased. Um, the, the other problem is that North American viewership, i.e. the people that matter to the sponsors who sponsor the league, has definitely gone down. Because even though average viewership increased, it increased by like 10,000. And those 10,000 people are Brazilian and European. A thousand percent. Um, because even though there are a bunch of Americans that watch Cadrill's co-stream, probably half of them are European at minimum. More than um, half, for sure. More than more than half. Almost certainly probably like 75%. And then also they're going to be Europe. Like, I don't think people understand this. Like my viewership is 75% European and I'm not European. So imagine what it yeah. is like when you actually are European. <laughs> You're European in spirit. I was gonna say you're, you're European not speaking now, a now. different language. You're not speaking European. You're still speaking English. <laughs> yeah. And and Tom, you are European now. To be fair, you yeah. you've transformed. <laughs> I'm honorary European. Um. um so uh, then uh, to to Tom's point, you have to consider the European percentages who are on other co streams on the main broadcast. Uh, Riot will have this data, by the way, on their Twitch and YouTube streams. Uh, they will be able to see this. Um, and so the point is, is like, I would actually guess that it might actually be minority North American viewers now. Like, it is possible that non-North American viewers now make up 
more than 50% of LCS viewers, which is trash for North American sponsors. And, you know, you can see that Riot is doing things as a result of this. So part of, I think, the motivation to do the new team participation agreement, which they announced where it would be a flat stipend instead of a rev share, is because they know that the rev share is going down, partially because of Esports Winter, but partially because the value of LCS sponsorships must be decreasing with the audience mix that they have. It must be. Um, and while higher numbers equals potentially more skin sales for Riot because they don't give any of that money to the teams, it's not going to be actually reflected in the rev shares that they receive. Um, so I do think Riot is doing things to correct this, to be fair to them. Um, but they are going to put out some crazy ass spin on these numbers of like, look, it is up slightly. But the reasons why it's up slightly, in spite of the fact that I think it is literally a better product than it was previously, I was more entertained by it. I think they did a good job. It is not reflected in the viewership numbers. In fact, by all, you know, sane metrics, it is actually down in the ways that it matters most, even if it is slightly up in average concurrent viewers, because it matters who those viewers are. And then I also have just further questions, such as if we are now going to throw a fucking parade because these average numbers are up, and the, we know that these average numbers are up specifically because of co-streams, then why were we not co-streaming every single game two years ago? Riddle me that. If it's such a fucking good thing to have these numbers up via any means possible, including co-streams, then why didn't they do this sooner? Oh, because uh, they just didn't like those co-streamers as much back then. <laughs> I don't think that's it. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think they like any co-streamers, to be fair. I think they hate yeah. the idea of co-streaming. It's just that Tarek owns Valorant now, and they can't do anything about it. Um, and like, I think that their, their attitude is that they can't stop it, and so they must participate in it, because otherwise people will go to different games and tank their viewership, and they're in a situation where they absolutely need that viewership at this point in time. But, you know, tell, you know, I, again, it's like nobody ever has to take responsibility at Riot for the dumbass decisions that they make. And if they are literally going to have a party about these numbers, then why didn't they do, you know, co stream? Why didn't they let Kadro co stream LCS last year? Why? Tell me. Why was he not allowed to co stream LCS last year? Why was Bayano not allowed to co stream LCS last year? If this is so fucking good. Can't tell you. No. Exa exactly. Because the brain trust up there at Riot is making these decisions, but you don't get to get away with it. You know, you don't get to get away with this. Um, so I I'll be making a separate video where I actually dig into the specific numbers and like show you guys. And like, because I, I have been a tournament organizer myself in the past, you know, <laughs> with very expensive productions and I have sold sponsorships on tournaments, seven figure sponsorships on tournaments. I can tell you how advertisers think about this. Um, and it's not going to be good. You know, it's not going to be good. So they, they will try and make this seem like a good thing, but we should celebrate LCS for the right things that they did, which is that it was more fun to watch. It was a better league with these eight teams in it. The games were more entertaining. It was a tighter broadcast. It was a more fun broadcast. They brought a ton of player personality into it. All these things are great, but the viewership is not great. The product got better. Yeah, it did. Credit to Mark. Dom, what do you what do you uh, when you think about this split? What are things that jump out of you for the LCS? Um, I mean, for for me, I, like obviously, like the viewership n numbers are not something that I really focus on. For me, I just care about like, am I enjoying my time watching the the game? And I feel like the the game is actually just better to watch. And I think that um, that orgs actually having less money to import people that don't actually want to be here um, is. You know, it, the fact that that's like gone and now you have people that actually want to be here getting those spots yeah, for less money difference. has made the league more competitive. Like it, it feels like there is Agreed. more hunger in the league with the teams. It feels like people are really fighting for their jobs and it makes the, the product more entertaining. So thank God we don't have to import like super wash Koreans at the end of their uh, career, like bang and 
you know, I mean, we had like crown and just like ha watch these players just like exist and be like, oh, they're like former world champions. So we're supposed to get hype and they just don't give a fuck. They don't produce any good results and they just go back after two years and retire. You, uh, you remember the, the Echo Fox anymore. Looper incident? Yeah. Oh, incident. <laughs> dude, dude. Echo Fox Looper was probably the most cynical washed signing because he like you have to understand looper was washed when he won a world championship and then he was washed he was extra washed in china and then he was extra 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 washed in america that was shocking yeah he was he was deep wash uh chat chat did bring up a pretty good point umpty is a player who's been around a little bit and could have fit that mold and then ends up being I would say no. He's he's not a player like that because he didn't have any like success. He was somebody who like was desperate to win because he has been a loser for his entire life up until this point. Well, that that was my point. You, it was like here's someone who seems like he couldn't get a job in L L L C K anymore, and came to N A and could have packed it in, but as you know, uh, uh, we've already hit before this great coaching staff having done their scouting report. I mean, I thought, I thought um, Umti was, I, I said this when they signed Umti, I thought Umti was a very good signing. Uh, yeah. Like, I think he is a good player and I think that he would be motivated in North America and his English is good. Yep. And he was underrated because he was on a dog shit Breon roster for the last couple of years, but he was the best part of that roster. People just like Lord Morgan memes, but Umti was the best player. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I like having a player like him. That's my whole point is I would much rather have a player that has not like, because like, what is a player like Bing coming to achieve in North America? Like, Actually, what is he coming to achieve in North America? He's played with Faker and won multiple world titles. When he joins 100 Thieves, you think he's going to be like, you think it's life or death for him? Like, he I mean, just impact, killed. you know, the, the counter argument is like impact and core after winning their world <laughs> titles, you know, did actually perform and are still, they just won a title again. Um, but I do think it, it at least so to be fair to core, he actually came to NA before he won the world title, then went back to Korea and then came back again. Mm -hmm. um, and then in Impact's case, he came pretty soon after winning his world title after the dissolution of that original SKT roster. And he just continued to prove his worth time and time again. And he, he was actually like on a pretty dog shit roster well, when he got here. I mean, it's also like he didn't come here for insane money. Like the, the Koreans that came That's here true. in season five did That's not true. come here for insane money the way that like people like Bang and like Crown were coming here for like literally like high hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions in their contract. Yeah. That didn't stop him from making those millions though. Impact Tower, baby. Real yep. estate. <laughs> you know, he doesn't have it anymore. He gave what? it, he like, well, he doesn't, he doesn't own it anymore. His dad owns it. I was talking to him like earlier and I was like, impact. He's like, yeah, I just gave it to my dad. He runs it now. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yep. All right. I, I, I would have felt bamboozled. I felt like I just talked to him this split about the tower itself. Um, yeah, I guess it's still I, in the family, but he used to like, it used to just be his and he would like, r like run it. And so now he's like, yeah, I just gave it to my dad. Now, now you got me thinking about it, Dom, about, about the umpty point And just, <laughs> I think their trophy lift is gonna like stick in my head for a while because that dude started crying like as soon as they won. <laughs> yeah, that was a because great interview he wants it so bad. Like he yeah. wants, like he's been trying so hard for so long. That that's what I'm saying. It's like like I want to see the people that have that are still in the struggle that are like that are grinding for it. I don't want to see players at the end of their career actually come to NA. It just doesn't do anything for the region. I think yeah. I'll, I think for me, uh, you guys have hit a lot of the the good and bad points about the product but also about the, you know, the marketing of the product and where it's at. Um, you know, what's wild is like, I wouldn't have to do all of this alarm bell ringing if Riot just didn't lie. Like, like I would just leave this. I don't want to fucking make a video where I have to meticulously go through all the viewership numbers to like untangle the lies. I would just be like, hey, I had much more fun watching it this split and I thought the product was better. But yep. it's the fact that they have to go out of their fucking way to lie about it that tilts me. But they're not going to shoot themselves in the foot and be like, well, viewership decreased, but we had a good product. Like that, that doesn't help them sell. Hey, either. you know what? You can, you know, there's always a choice to say nothing, Degon. That is true. The master of saying nothing, Monty. Except when he <laughs> does, and then it's impactful. <laughs> I think but it's, it's like, it, you know, you, you 
you absolutely can just say, hey, we had a great split. We like the improvements that we did. Um, and we're happy with, you know, bringing in new audiences via our co-streamers. End of story. That can be your statement. But I know it's not going to be their statement, so I have to preempt it because they're going to they've they've already tried to spin the bullshit because they were trying to spin the bullshit around the Super Bowl weekend. And it's like and we had the finals on Easter again after John Needham last year said that it was a mistake to have the finals on Easter and we didn't have a stadium event. Like, come on, guys. I mean, what could you do, Instead, man? What could you do? There's it, nothing else you could do. You, there was nothing else. You know, it's not like on Easter. It's not yeah, like for and, and, the week before they could have just skipped a day of LCS and, and LEC. That's not possible. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And and also they did things to Dom's point where it's like they literally last weekend moved all of the uh, all of the Western League of Legends off of Sunday for a Valorant title in spite of the fact that they have been saying that Valorant and League have very little audience crossover. So why do we need to do that? Or like if they why really care about esports, Sunday? why didn't they just move Easter off LCS finals day? <laughs> Genius. <laughs> they should have time traveled and just killed Jesus on a different weekend. Jesus. I think, I think <laughs> Jesus dying once is good enough. Um, <laughs> I think the story of the split. It wasn't the <laughs> Romans, guys. It was actually Riot time traveling, I hate to tell you. They were the ones who told Pontius Pilate to do it. But they picked the wrong date, just like at MSI in Tallahassee, where uh, they scheduled the the MSI, the first MSI, uh, when all of the college students had actually gone home for summer. Mm -hmm. They're not good with dates. I think that this Blitz story will is still being written in terms of if APA and Jan end up growing into being great players, they'll go back and be like, this was the split because Jan Jan really hadn't proven anything. And I think after two years of being on the top roster was, was looked at as, you know, potential import, but so was APA as they were using, uh, there, the, there was calls to use their backup mid laner. Who is, who is it? Romer? Is that who it was? Yep. Dom? Yeah. Romer. Romer. So like he buckled down when it mattered most. And, you know, I think they beat some of the demons, Specifically, Jan and, and APA beat some of the demons that, that Pioshik threw up at him after Worlds last year. We're like, we couldn't do anything. My mid laner was shit. What did you expect? Uh, and then went on the content. Yeah. And then Pioshik went, and, and, and this is my favorite part. The, Pioshik went on to just miss every fucking smite and pretty much solo <laughs> lose his team in the series in the KT versus Gamon series. Like, this I guy can't people, smite to save his life. I told people. When you celebrate the good Pioshik games, you just have to keep it in your brain that the bad ones are coming. You actually don't want the good games to be on the meaningless games, guys. You don't want him to completely dominate some bad teams because that means the bad games are going to come when it matters. See, think about his world's run. The bad games came at the end of LCK in summer. Then he got benched. Then Juwan got them to worlds. And then he had his good games at Worlds. You actually missed all the bad games that happened right in the lead up to Worlds. Yep. Yeah, look, and his good games at this this past Worlds got him onto KT. They're like, holy shit, he almost killed Faker. Did he? Did no, he but just... you know what's so funny about this like TL like this this TL run is like people forget how bad of an appearance it actually was for TL at Worlds. Like people are like, oh, they almost beat T1. It's like, do you remember like what happened after that? Like, do you remember like then they got like their asses whooped by nrg and yeah. then they lost the fucking gam like they ended up in the last like come on man like it was actually such a horrible appearance at worlds for tl but people just always like forget They're like well if they didn't lose the game they would have lost to like bds or dom Juan or somebody in, in, in the end of the bracket so it doesn't really matter yeah i mean again this is ian's this is APA. He's still within one year of playing professional League of Legends. Still yep. one year. And so I, I, I just, I think that the impact of what happens to them and if Cloud9 make changes, which I've heard is around like 50% into Summer Split, what happens with that team and their trajectory. So, uh, and then I guess lastly, it's Sniper. The Sniper show was so fun. 
the sniper solo kills during the regular season and expecting him to do something and then having this young of a player show up, talk some smack, and then solo kill everyone in the league except Whippo was very fun. I think that was like such a cool thing to watch. So uh, a lot of this split will be, I think, rewritten in the future based on what happens to them at, uh, uh, later on. So uh, thanks, LCS 2024 spring. It was a lot of fun and uh, it was a nice little change in terms of the product. Can't right, wait for finals Easter next year. <laughs> I'm <laughs> we, can you please remind me of this? There are two things that Mark Z needs to answer for. It's one, don't let it be on Easter next year. And two, two, where do fines go? Where do the fines go? When Crocs, when when they wore the Crocs and got fined, you don't want to know. Go? You you don't want to know the answer to that question, Degon, because I can tell you exactly where Mark Merrill's fines went. So remember when, uh, remember when Mark Merrill was caught uh, having only Jaximus boost his uh, solo queue account for him. Yep, oh, and it no. went to his own charity. Uh, it went to a charity called City Year in Los Angeles, which if you actually look it up, I shit you not, people complain that it is like a cult. And I'm pretty sure, so Mark Merrill's on the board of this charity, or he was at the time. And I'm pretty sure he got all of his cult ideas for how to design Riot's culture directly from this charity, because everything I've read about this charity sounds exactly like Riot um, in the way that they have their, their like company culture. And so when he, when, by the way, you are, we've had pro players like literally kicked off servers, you know, for boosting, right? Um, he paid like, I think $10,000 or something like that to the charity that he was on the board of. That is a very fucking weird charity. Um, so maybe it goes there. I beat only Jacksmith in a <laughs> uh, county fair tournament. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was back in like 2015, and Damn. that was the moment when I was like, "I think I want to do this thing." <laughs> we we mm. played outside in the summer heat under a tent. There's a picture of me and my four friends playing, and I think it was we had a roster of six, and our best player couldn't play, so we all had to roll swap. I think I played Kale mid and got just absolutely shoved in the finals, but we beat their team for the qualifier. It was awesome. That's my only connection. Mm -hmm. them. Anyways um all right guys thanks for a hell of an episode thanks for uh sticking on dom after another five game banger series in the lpl uh any special as as always anything special happening this week dom um uh, no not really i mean i'm gonna be doing my thing doing lck and lpl it's kind of annoying that they're like on at the Whoa. same time so i have to like go between games but i'll be hate watching t1 live tomorrow that's what matters <laughs> Also, so. this is this is where uh you know the bangers really start in both leagues because we're into the double elimination portion of LCK. And now we're into where FPX and JDG enter the room in LPL. So this is where it starts to get like oh, we really already had we already had three five game bangers in, in LPL. Like we're already <laughs> just having just absolute just crazy ass games. Like the the rookie <laughs> game, the rookie ace hole game, that was fucking crazy. So we're deep Rookie in the bangers. We already had the the banger of Dom one as well. So, Rookie or Milky Way? Here. Dom. What'd you say? Rookie or Milky Way? Uh, I think FPX just seems like a better team right now. And I it depends. Want, who do you want to win? Um, These are your boys. Those were your OMG boys on NIP with Rookie. Yeah. Come on. I, don't, I mean, I don't really like Aki, though. Aki has always been my least favorite member of that OMG lineup. Like, I don't think Aki is good. I, like, if, if Shanji performs, I want to see him win. I don't want to see Shanji's corpse get dragged into the BLG series just to have him shoved into a locker by Bin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Monty, uh, anything special this week? What you got? Uh, apparently I'm going to be making that viewership video about Riot <laughs> and their lies. Apparently. You did that. You did that to yourself. <laughs> no, Riot does this, and then I'm the only one who can respond to their bullshit. So. All right. Um... It's my duty, Degon. It's my duty. As, as the number one Riot outcast, I'm the, only, I'm the only man who can fight against the dark tide of their lies. This is true. This is true. This is my captain. 
Um, <laughs> for me, the championship interviews with APA and Inspired will be coming out this week. Uh, it was really good. Really good APA interview. I mean, it's yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Watching that. But the the spawn one was really good too. He just he went there. He he I could he he was showing something. I went with it. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. Spawn's a great human being and uh, now a championship winning coach. Um, yeah, thank you so much for watching, everyone. Fifty episodes in the book. I I think my my favorite one is the milk one. There we go. It was the protein shake one that you were like, <laughs> we went off topic and started talking about milk. Uh, let us know which ones was your favorite and why you've been watching Sticking Along. We appreciate all of you guys and catch you guys next time for another episode of Power Spike. See ya. <laughs>